Happy Friday. As you may have noticed, this morning we have some guests. We have Dale and John. I'm sure you, uh, you guys recognize them from studio, right? Most of you. Uh, they're here because the subject of today's lecture is sunlight parametrics. And I just introduced the uh, final project yesterday in lab, which was to uh, work on a metric-based design. And I sort of alluded to one of the metrics that y you could consider would be sunlight. Uh, and what I'm going to show you today are a few architectural examples of some, uh, basically some sunlight driven forms. And then I'm going to talk about how you can make those parametrically, right? Again, there's different kinds of metrics that we can, that we can use. We could, we could do things with like sound. We could do things with occupation. Uh, we could do things with, you know, uh, trying to diagram like square footage. Um, but a lot of what you're doing in studio is amenable to sunlight. And so that's kind of what I want to focus on today, right? Um, to start off with, as Dale reminds me, Sunlight is not the same as daylight. So we talk a lot about daylighting and how we want to, you know, sort of make sure that a space is well, like, illuminated. We want to uh, make sure that people have enough light where they're working. It falls under the rubric of daylighting. Daylighting is difficult uh, at this point to simulate parametrically, at least in, in terms of the things that we know how to do. So a lot of the things that I'm going to be showing you today have to do with sunlight, and that's why I, I, I talk about sunlight parametrics today. Um, we, can, we can pretty easily... Well, we'll see how easy it is in a minute here. We can, we can get the sun angle parametrically, and then we can drive things based upon uh, a conditional logic with that angle. Uh, but we can't get, you know, daylight information. So, so we can't get, like, illuminance values in real time that we can use to drive this. There are ways to do it, but it's very, very complicated and pretty slow, actually, computationally. You can't really, like, manipulate things in real time. Uh, right now and still get the daylighting bounces and things that we saw like, like let's say for instance like in V-Ray, okay? Um, when you do it like an Ecotect, if any of you guys have used Ecotect, it, it takes a few seconds to process even at low resolution So it's not really something we can work with But what you can do with the examples I showed you today is that first of all you guys have had classes where you talked about daylighting and So you know a few rules of thumb and if you don't we'll like remind you today hopefully uh, you can you can design something that is already taking it, that, that's, that's pretty smart. It's, it's using daylighting in like the right way. Then you can tune it because you have a parametric system, right? You can tune it, you can, you can adjust the parameter, then you can bake it, throw it in a V very quickly, get those sunlight bounces, right? Then you can erase that geometry, play with it again, bake it, put it in a V ray. So through that iterative process, it's not like real time, but you can study daylight uh, as part of your parametric process, right? So, a lot of what I'm focusing on uh, that's interactive in, v in, in Grasshopper is sunlight, uh, but you can still study daylight, all right? <clears throat> sunlight, it, it, we're really concerned with, um, with like the glare uh, that it causes and the, and the heat. I think you guys kind of know experientially what that's about. Um, so we're interested in when there's like a direct angle that penetrates into a space where there are people, right? So you wouldn't want too much glare in circulation spaces or in uh, workspaces, you really want, wouldn't want glare anyway. Um, so um, a lot of the examples I'm going to show you, you would consider uh, ways to minimize uh, glare, let's say, okay? And that's actually what I'm going to begin to talk about. The first thing, though, is we have to actually figure out a way to get the sun angle into Grasshopper, all right? And there isn't just like a component that you can plug in that um, does this. Um, I find it kind of fun, though, when you have to make one of these things yourself. So. Uh, I'm going to show you, you know, you guys, have, you guys have had this theory, I think, before. I don't know if you've ever, uh, you, you, nobody ever really has to calculate these. They kind of, they, they're, they're kind of, this, this data is available. But how would you get this into Grasshopper in a three-dimensional way that's parametric, all right? <clears throat> so what I, what I uh, have done, I mean, you can go to a website like this, this sun angle calculator, and you can, you can get, like, the azimuth angle for the sun at a particular time. You can get, you can get this information. <laughs> And essentially, it will allow you to draw this kind of diagram, right? And this is almost parametric right here. If we have, like, say, a spreadsheet of all these values, there's a way that we could do this, but we really um, we have to kind of do it uh, manually. So what, what, I, what I can do, though, is I can go to this web page. And if you just Google sun angle, I think it's the first link, as a matter of fact. But I can put in our zip code, and I can, uh, and I can look it up. Is it emailing my data? I don't need to email it to somebody. Oh, you know what? I'm not online yet. All right, then. Hang on a second. 
It's not real time yet. Okay. All right. Well, anyway, you can put in this information, and it gives you uh, the altitude angle of the sun at a particular time of day and the azimuth angle. And the altitude is, um, is, is basically like where, where it is in the sky uh, on, on this kind of axis, right? So that gives us this angle. And then the, the, other, the other dimension that we get, um, the azimuth angle, is basically where, where it would fall along this kind of axis, so, so along the kind of xy plane. So I'll make more sense when I actually show it to you. All right, so this is going to seem really complicated, but there's nothing in here that you haven't, you haven't already seen before. Let me go ahead and get this uh, queued up here. So inside of Grasshopper, I start off with just a point. All right, just our, just our zero, zero, zero uh, point. And I use that to draw a line. And I'm actually jumping the gun here to hide all this stuff. Okay, I use that to draw a line. And basically what I'm doing is I'm recreating this chart, okay? And um, then I take that line and I can change the scale of it. It's real basic, right? <clears throat> then I take my rotate, which, we, which, we, which we've used a ton, right? And I can rotate that line, you know, in this plane and in that plane according to the data that I got from the website. And so what I did was I looked at the, um, at the, at, at the, at the angle at sunrise for, for the day that I'm interested in, which right now is, uh, is like the, the worst day of the year, right? The summer, like the summer equinox. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, the summer solstice, right? We're gonna get the most sun for the most time of day, right? We, we started talking about this. We wanna plan for the, when we're doing it with sunlight, we wanna look for the worst case scenario. So I, I got into the website, I found out what time sunrise was, and I found out where the sun starts in the sky. I found out where it is at noon, which, is, which ostensibly is, the, is like the peak, and then the sunset angle, and I got three uh, lines. Okay, and we can all do that. And then I went in and I rotated one of them in 3D, the, the one at noon. I found out what the, what, what the altitude was at noon, what the altitude angle was at noon, and I rotated that line so this line got rotated uh, 77 degrees. And this is all the stuff that I got from the, uh, the website. So I can go ahead and hide this, okay? And as you might know from AutoCAD or geometry or whatever, if we have three points, we can, we can plot an arc through those three points. And that arc is gonna be the course of the sun across the sky, okay? One, two, three, boom, boom, boom. There's our arc, okay? So that's a, our that's a path for that, for that time of the year. That's essentially what we're seeing in this diagram here, all right? So again, nothing that we haven't already seen before, but we're just using, this is actually a metric-based design already, right? I went to the website, I got the angle numbers for it for this particular time, punched them in. These are panels, right? I can just double-click and change these. So this is actually like reusable. If I wanted the winters, if one of the winter solstices, I could plug in those numbers. Okay, I get my arc, then I did something. So now I need to plot, I need to figure out where the sun is at a particular time of day. And you guys have probably seen this like evaluate uh, curve piece, which basically, uh, if, I, if I put in a certain length along the curve, I can find out like where, where like a point is, right? But that only works, that, that only looks at the length of the curve or it looks at an input value between zero and one. And that doesn't really work for us. We're interested in the, in the time of day, right? If I want something at one o'clock, how do I know exactly where that is along that curve? I can't necessarily like divide this by any kind of fraction or by any kind of proportion. I need to be a little bit uh, sneaky about it. So what I did was, remember like the remap component that we've used a lot, right? What I can do is I can remap the time to the length of the curve, and then I can use that to tell me exactly where a point is along that curve. So I, I took in the sunrise time and the sunset time and military time, right? Because I can't, I can't figure out whether something is 2 p.m. or 2 a.m., so I need to resort to that. I take those times uh, 60, because again, these are, if we don't do that, it's gonna be looking at it as, as basically, basically, basically like a decimal. If we get to 100, it's gonna roll over. We don't wanna do that. We wanna think in terms of minutes, right? <clears throat> so then I, then I remap mine and I, and I take a slider and I set it manually to the sunrise and the sunset. So there's my day right there. I have a day slider, okay? And then I, and then I, and then I, and then I take that time 60. And believe it or not, that actually gives me basically like a sundial. Okay, so if I want one o'clock, and you just go to 1300, somewhere in there, 
And that would be where the sun is at 1300 in there, okay? So you can build your own uh, sun, sun system in Grasshopper, all right? Somebody upload this online and make a million dollars, right? There, 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 doesn't ex there isn't like a component that does this yet, but it's not that hard to make. I can sit down in 10 minutes and, and put one together. So then what we end up with that's useful to us now is we have this point and that point, which is actually where we might put our model. This is kind of like Dale's you know, like mechanical uh, piece that you put your models on, right? You measure the angle where your model is and where the sun is, and there's your sun angle, okay? And you can rotate your model. This assumes that uh, north is up. You could rotate this whole thing, or you could rotate your model. But basically, if you put that in, if you put a parametric thing in the center of this, that line that you get is the crux of all of the sketches I'm about to show you. Okay? Does anybody have any questions about the sun system? Is it yeah. possible to um, <clears throat> set the sun on that point and literally be able to parametrically change where it is? V-Ray already does it, but we just can't get the information about where the angle is. That's why we have to build this thing. Okay. That's how, this is what V-Ray does. Yeah. Good question. Though. Yeah. Um, it'd be great. I mean, if you, I guess if you were in Rhino, what you could do is you could put a light on that, you know, that, that's in Rhino to simulate the sun, but the V-Ray sun is so much better you than that. You also have to rebake it every time you would change the time of day, wouldn't you? Yeah, and I actually have a trick for that. Uh, that, I'll, that, I'll, that I'll post later. But there, there's actually a component that saves what's baked. And if you click it, it erases it. So you can just keep putting things in. So it makes it easier to like bake and rebake the uh, sketch. I'm not going to show that right now. But OK, so <clears throat> now we got a sun system. A little boring, but I'll, the other stuff is more exciting. All right. So first I want to talk about our louvers. I think you guys, have, you guys have lectured about this. You guys have talked about this. Some of you had this project in our class, right? The, uh, the new, you know, like, the, the new like Telefonica building. So this is an example of a horizontal louver, and the idea is to is to prevent direct sunlight from you know like coming into the space. Seen some crazy examples of vertical louvers. When do you use a horizontal louver and when do you use a vertical louver? Just in a general rule of thumb sort of sense here. Horizontal east to west, vertical to south. Great. Yeah. Exactly. Right. Opposite. 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 Yeah. Well, I, I, well, at least at least these at least they're. Uh, yeah, so what, what, what's the right way? Vertical. Horizontal and south. Horizontal and south. Are they right? Yeah. All right. I'm asking the experts out there. All right. That's okay. Now, what might be interesting is if your building happens to be on a different, like, orientation, if it's actually on an angle, it's not like a pure north, pure south, you might have to get a little bit tricky with it. You might need both vertical and horizontal, like, elements, right? But yeah, as a general rule of thumb, I think it's a good, good way to think about it. I'm going to show you how to adjust both vertical and horizontal uh, louvers, okay? Other, and then you actually can get into things like this, which I'll show you also. And then you can get into even weirder uh, things like this. This is actually an operable skin. And some of these, I mean, some of them are about sun angle, and some of them can be just about creating uh, views onto things, right? As the skin begins to peel... Um, you might you might do that to actually orient people in the building to certain to certain views as well as block out the sunlight. We'll see how long this thing keeps working, but this is a, like a like like a bendable material um, with these with these like tensioning devices inside of it. All right, so to um, to work with louvers, I'm actually going to go ahead and um, open up a different file here. Yes, I am. I am recording this. We're all on record here. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So let me. I'm going to go ahead and um, start with this script here. So what I what I'm going to start with is a. Um, okay. This is a, a a line, and it's going to be oriented uh, east west. Okay. And um, what, I'm, what I'm doing with this line is creating some, some perpendicular frames, okay? And then I'm attaching um, a rectangle to it. You can see here. So there's a rectangle at, at either end of this. And the rectangle is parametric. I can adjust the, uh, the different sliders here, okay? Um, what I can do with that is I can loft those together. So I take 
just take those two cross sections, and that, that kind of gives me a basic kind of louver piece, right? You can adjust that to the, to, to the different, you know, like size of your building. Then I'm going to go ahead and move these in a series. So this is all stuff we know how to do, too. We're just, right, we're just making a bunch of copies of these that we can play with. It's actually pretty good. I'm going to leave it at that. Okay? Whoops. Hide them. There we go. Let's go ahead and hide all these two. So now I've got these and I've got my I've got my sound system here. And what I want to do is I basically want to find I want to find the angle between where these things are and where the um, sun is. And I mentioned that it's really important we had this this point that represents where the sun is, and then we had the center point. <clears throat> What I want to do is actually get make a vector of those, and a vector is basically like a line, right? You have you have, you have two points, and a vector gives us a magnitude, but it gives us it gives us actually like a direction. What I want to do is I want to measure the direction between the ground and the angle of the sun, right? And that gives me the angle in between those, and that's that's our angle that's intersecting our louvers right now. Right, right now our louvers are flat. Okay, so first things first, I need to find that that angle. <clears throat> And I don't want to chase my, I, I need to get that point that's all the way at the beginning of my script. It's just the first 0, 0, 0 point, so I'm just going to make a quick new point there. So now I have a vector. You remember, you can't see vectors unless you actually explicitly throw in the, the like, show vector uh, tool. But rest assured, they're there. The other thing you want to do is, is put an angle component in. And an angle takes the angle between two vectors. So there's my one vector. And here's my second vector, which is actually just what? The x-axis. Okay, I don't need to know where that, where that vector. Uh, I, I don't need to generate that vector from my object because these are, these, these are directly oriented. If I, if I needed to get that vector in a different orientation, I might draw a line that's on a horizontal frame on those or I might, or I might just manually draw a line that's perpendicular to, to my building face, okay? Just to get that angle. But in this case, since it's on the X, I made my life easier. And then you actually get an angle. <clears throat> and this is key. I messed this up this morning when I was testing this. The angle actually comes out of the radians. We always have to convert our thing from, you know, from basically, uh, we always have to convert to radians when we're doing the sliders. In this case, you don't need to convert to radians. It's already in radians. If you try to convert it, you're not going to get any angle, basically. It's going to be so small, you're not going to see any, any difference. So now I have my angle. And then what remains is to rotate my louvers in response to that angle. So I can go in and I want to do a rotate 3D component. And I think we've seen this before. I know we've used rotate a lot. Rotate 3D takes into account like an axis of rotation. So it has like a hinge. A lot of the times we do like a point, like a top. Okay. This is what we want. We want to pay attention to that, to that hinging. <clears throat> so I pipe my geometry in. I pipe in my angle. And just a note, this is interesting. There's the angle and then there's a reflex angle, which is the opposite angle of it. So if you mess it up and it looks like it's rotating backwards, just plug in the other one, okay? You don't even have to like make a negative or anything like that. You have the angle and you have its opposite. In this case, though, I want the primary uh, angle, <clears throat> A for A. And then the center of rotation, and this is key, right? This, so this, kind of, this is one of these bugs that always messes us up. You need to get the, the center of rotation for every one of these components, or for every one of these uh, panels, not just the, the base one. So you get that, get that centroid for all those. But see, now, now we're not, we're not, we don't have the right axis, so we need, we need the axis of rotation. And in this case, it's just the y-axis. And then we go ahead and hide these, and there you go. I'm going to um, play with this a second here. So this is the sun. I might, actually, I might have the angle uh, back. So I'm going to change the scale of the sun here. It doesn't actually do anything. It's just a visual. The angle is always going to be... Greater. Okay. And if I move the uh, the sun time, which is this big slider over here, yeah, I think I actually need to flip that angle. Did it myself. Okay. Um, let's just do this with the reflex angle. There we go. So you can see that <clears throat> that is blocking the sun at that particular time, and as the sun goes through the sky. Those are responding perpendicular to that to that angle. Okay. Now, what do you do with that? Well, Dale, what do you do with that? Like, when do you plan 
I mean, if we don't we don't always have moving louvers. If you want to, if we want to make the best the best configuration of a louver, what's the rule of thumb? Yeah, for a fixed liver. Uh, I don't mean to put you on the spot. I just, well, I, you know, it, it's all latitude dependent, which is a big question that I have. With this? With that. Yeah. And, uh, that happens to associate directly with your input. Whatever. But you get the latitude and longitude from the website. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, your, your objective here should be. Uh, optimize shading what we don't see over the bit, yeah. over a specific period of time, or over a particular month uh, and period of days. Mm -hmm. So, building the object that you built, mm -hmm. I would, I would think that how I could evaluate the shading device would be how well does it shade over that particular period. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we've kind of talked, alluded to that. Yeah. Say, if this were the sun arc for March 1st, mm -hmm. and the range then of arcs for through March 1st to March 21st, mm -hmm. then we could run the sun, and we could also run the sun penetration patterns, and mm -hmm. say that by the 21st, we don't want any sun in that space. Mm -hmm. Because we've got a metric that says the cooling season doesn't get solar radiation. Yeah. So, uh, so we need to find the angle at, at a period of times exactly. and then design it for between so, those between so those angles. Literally okay. by articulating the movable nature of, of the shading device, mm -hmm. you've created a Venetian blind. Yeah. Uh, and you and if it's a, an architectural element you've created the need for something that moves. Right? So it has yeah. to be controlled. Yeah. Yeah, so this could be this could be motorized. We talked about this. It could be programmed. It, yeah. Exactly. And, and that's not beyond the pale. I mean, yeah. There's plenty, of, there's plenty of stuff out there that can do that. An open loop system that Gilead staff that sees the sun mm. can send that information back to the control room and operate that external information line. Matter of fact, it's the Germans are making that you can actually uh, apply new designs to right now. Mm -hmm. uh, the Terry and Thomas building in Seattle. So we would need to do, like you said, probably a series of, of these and then basically like record record the angle that we get. For, for the for the particular span, for particular days, and then make, make a design that's like the average of those, or? No, actually, actually it might be interesting to think about it that way. Okay. Uh, well, the, the notion is that the old rule of thumb mm -hmm. is critical. Do they know what bounce point temperature is? Yes. Well, you probably yeah. don't know. They do. They're yeah. going to remember yeah. now. Yeah. But for every building, Occupancy type, there's a balance point temperature at which the building is going to move from the heating cycle to the cooling cycle. Yeah. Uh, as opposed to the artificial one that we deal with in storage. Mm -hmm. uh, the, that may, but the rule of thumb said March 1st, you have to begin to cut the sun off by 50%. Okay. So the day before that, you can accept 100% sun through the aperture of whatever the orientation mm -hmm. will be. The next day, 50% of the sun has to be cut off. So the important piece of the, the object that, that you create here mm -hmm. for me is the next layer. I need to see the sun from the penetration. I yeah. need to see the shadow. Uh, and that's being cast by those lights inside. Yeah. So it's not just actually about like reversing the angle of it, but actually actually doing a study with the with the V ray or something. So actually, you could be doing an extinction calculation. Yeah. That would say in the floor area how much sun has now been mm. has been eliminated. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, uh, but everything you've done so far 
Yeah. Uh, plus what we've been talking about, Ecotech can do. Yeah. In, in, the, in its uh, solar team. Oh, yeah, yeah. And you can get Ecotech information back into the Grasshopper, so, but it's so a little the cumbersome. Is, the thing that I think is important for all of you to realize, and the class to realize, is that this technique can actually apply directly to how you want to use specific tools for yeah. this design, as opposed to connecting a number of different Yeah. Outside. Yeah. And it's a good illustration of you know, just kind of graphically, kind of in like a geometric way of what actually happens in these, in these paths. Yeah, I mean, having to actually construct these, I think, is really is really helpful. Do you, okay. uh, do you know what the Baldwin diagram is? No, I don't think I do. If all of you, you know, everybody understands the silver art, right? yeah. and how to connect, and how to create that for the entire year. And that's basically going over the top of this, right? Mm. Apparently. We created a window aperture, and we took that sun arc and tilted it around the window. Mm -hmm. right? There would be an arc, a different oh, it's, arc, yeah. and, and that arc would then be allow you, as you move to create a parametrically different angle, mm -hmm. horizontally or vertical, uh, mm -hmm. to show you what part of the the sunlight that would be eliminated. Mm. Uh, so I can, I'll, I'll, I'll yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe a way to do that actually in here, with a like putting a camera like inside of the window location and being able to track that point. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Let's. Um, you guys have questions about the horizontal louvers? The vertical louvers are pretty pretty similar principle. So if we're going to I'm going to go ahead and we're going to change uh, the orientation. I'm trying to think of how much this is going to break this. Okay, I'm going to change the orientation of that line to the uh, x axis. And then uh, what I want to do, I'm going to do a couple of different things here. Instead of perpendicular frames, I want to do a series of horizontal frames because I'm going to be you know, putting a bunch of vertical fins in this piece. So these are my frames. And then I'm going to, let's see, I'm going to drop a component here. So this is going to be the number of uh, fins that I have. And then what I'm going to do is actually I'm going to draw another uh, SDL line at each of those fins, and that's going to represent um, each fin. So we plug that in for the uh, base point of the line, and then the fins are in the z-axis. Let's forget how my there we go. <clears throat> and um, we need to turn preview on. So there we go, a bunch of lines there. So that's actually going to be the piece that's going to um, help us extrude these. Okay, and then the other the other piece that I need to do is I'm going to take these rectangles. I need to kill all this here. No, I need to keep some of these. Okay, take the rectangles. And the rectangles are going to go at the base of each of these uh, frames. The computer just locked up. All right. I didn't do anything broken here. That shouldn't do that. All righty then. Well, I have I have this uh, saved anyway. So, all right. Let's um open up another copy of. Rhinoceros, then. Okay. One second. Sorry. Okay. I'm just going to go ahead and skip to the skip to the file here. Okay. So if we look at our system. Actually what I what I did in What? 
Okay. Huh. That's really bizarre. Okay, give me one second here. I assure you, there's nothing uh, that should crash it in this. One more time. So I'm just, in this case, I actually am going to draw just a line and reference it as my, but you can do an SDL line as well. Okay. What happens is I create a bunch of frames, right? And actually, okay, and at the ends of those frames, I'm going to turn all this off here. At the ends of those frames, I'm going to place a rectangle. Okay, and the rectangles are, I played with the um, scale of them so that they have this kind of grain to them. And that, you do that with these, with these sliders. It's all stuff we know how to do. Then I extruded them to a particular uh, height. And that actually, and so that, that gives me the base, the base for those. Then I, I do the same thing I did last time where I, I get that line, that, that vector from the center point to where the sun is, right? So from there to there. I find the angle between that, and this time I need to find the, I, I find the angle between that and the X. And then I'm actually going to, to rotate them 3D, only this time the, the 3D um, axis is, um, is actually based on where the frames are and it's pointing straight up. So they're gonna, they're gonna actually pivot like a top instead of like a hinge this time. The angle is not, it's not a, it's not a, uh, uh, it's, it's actually happening in two axes. And because of the way we're rotating it, we're, that it basically allows us to look at those two axes. So if I look at this in the front view now, with these, and I adjust the sun. Let me actually turn this off already. All right, yeah, it's not gonna do anything if I don't, there we go. Okay. So if I adjust the sun, these are gonna open and move basically. Let's take a look at these in perspective. So you can see, let me uh, reduce the scale here. That helps, okay. Same parameters as the, as the last time for June 15th, time of day. So going from morning and then adjusting the dimension. So it's the same, same idea. Actually, in this case I need I think I need to flip the angle again. But anyway, it's the same, it's the same idea as the last. Uh, there we go. It's always, it's always the opposite of the uh, angle. Okay, so I'll post this script as well, but we can talk to, we can talk to Dale and John about you know, how to design uh, for this kind of condition as well. And I think it's a pretty similar like principle, right? We want to look for the um, peak peak times of the year and we want to design so that we eliminate most of the sunlight during those times. And you can do that with the same method. So you just want to find like, you want to do a couple different versions of this with different days of the year and measure the final angle that you get. And you can basically design around that. Or you could, you could suggest that yours is somehow like mechanical or it's somehow programmed and that this is, um, this is your system. The other thing that I want to do with this is an I've, yeah, John? You got to render it. it. This doesn't happen in Grasshopper. Okay. Yeah. So I have to make kind of a. You can make a model. Educated guess or educated you need to start with an educated guess so that you don't have to render a lot. Right. But then what you can do is you can you can basically make a box that this thing goes in, like you would like you'd bring into like the Heliodon, right? Right. And this is the piece that you're going to change at your desk, and then you're going to bring back. So you bake this, put that into that box, render it. Right. Then you can delete this, try again with another version of it, and, and, and you get a series of renderings at different times of day, and that's how you can sort of take that measurement. It's not like, it's not like scientific, but you do get a pretty good sense intuitively just through the, through the visual feedback you get of what that penetration is going to be. And that's the process that I've used. Um, again, it's not like, uh, like Ecotect or like Radiance, but it's pretty, uh, it's pretty intuitive. So, Okay. Um, what I want to do now is, is probably of interest to some of you who've talked to me about this. I want to do this kind of twisted uh, facade. So I wanted, this is actually what I started to do. So I'll take an SDL line, 
at each of these uh, frames. And the direction it's going to go is in the Z. So you go ahead and get rid of this now. So you get a bunch of lines, basically, right? And then you remember the point on curve component? If I plug it in, I get, so in this case, I get the midpoint, 50%. I want to get the midpoint, the start point, uh, and the end point of those. All right? <clears throat> then what I'm going to do is take my rectangles. I'll take my rectangle. And I'm going to place the first rectangle set at the top of these. See that? And these are these are straight up and down. Okay, then the second set I'm going to place at the midpoint. So I'm just going to copy, make a copy of these, place them at the midpoint. And those are also going to be. But what I'm going to do with these actually is a, is a little bit different. I'm actually going to flip the X and the Y for these so that they're oriented this way. Oh, actually, that's what I want to do on top here. Let's do that. We'll do X and Y here, and we'll flip them here. So they start off uh, horizontal, and then they go vertical. And then for the last set, I'm going to do the same thing. And then I'm going to put them on the zero. Okay, so three sets of these things. In space, and actually, I'm going to play. This is actually what's nice about having them all be dependent on each other. I can play with that parameter, and they all change. The middle set, in this case, in this example, is the one that I'm interested in because I'm going to take a sun angle, and I'm going to let that. I'm going to let that drive their rotation. Okay, so we have three sets of curves. We're going to we're going to flatten. Oh, no, wait. We're going to graft all three sets. And then we're going to loft them. So this is the pattern that we've used a lot of different uh, a lot of times. We have to graph them because the data structures have to match. Otherwise, our lofts turn themselves inside out. <clears throat> Shift click. And I think I need to. I might need to flip the, uh, the first set. But um, the idea of this is that, again, as the sun angle changes, now the, the louver part is the part that's in the center. Okay. And you get that kind of warping. I think I might need to actually, once again, change the angle here. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but it actually gets more interesting when you have a long form that's moving across multiple axes as your base curve. Need a lot more of these two. Okay. So once you get different orientations of these, the angles of them change more. And this is how you get those facades like you're seeing in the magazines. So you can see how they actually They'll have different angles of rotation from each other, like slightly different. And that's going to create that interesting kind of effect. Can I yeah, sure. The yeah, that's the time of day. That's the time of day. Yeah. Yeah, it's just, it's a, it's a number that represents the, oh, and actually, I'm making a mistake here because it's actually going up to the, uh, to like 15, 77, ooh, I need to change that. But the idea of that is that yeah, that should be the time of day. Yeah. That, there's, a, there's actually a bug uh, with that. My mistake. Um, but anyway, so that, that like twisting effect that some of you guys have asked me about is about having multiple cross sections, uh, one of them rotating or two of them rotating and then being able to change that. And what's cool about this, this setup is that I can change that, I can change where the twisting occurs by changing where the point is uh, on the line, okay? So that's how you end up with something some, something sort of like this, right? You can rotate that. If you wanted to change the center of rotation to, to more of a, the, a pin, 
than than one that's in the center, uh, you, you could get an effect that's more like this. But that's how they, that's how we can model uh, things like this. Okay. Any questions about the the vertical louvers or the like warping uh, script? And I'm gonna I'm gonna post these um, and I'll I'll fix that bug there. So. Monica, did you have a question? Oh, okay. Cool. All right. Next thing I want to talk about are apertures and openings. And to me, I, I know I may get this uh, like nomenclature wrong, but to me, an aperture is something that's like variable. That can be that can be irised or that can be open and closed to some degree. And an opening is something that's just an opening. It's not going to be able to be uh, changed in size or or, or actually uh, changed. They may be the same thing, uh, but that's how I'm that's how I'm talking about them. Um, you guys know this project, Jean Nouvel? Pretty, pretty classic, Pritzker Prize winning, right? So this is um, an institute uh, for the modern, uh, modern Arab, I think. Or the, this is in uh, Paris, and it's a, it's a, um, it's a building. It has this facade with these uh, uh, panels that that can iris um, open and closed. They have light sensors, and they're supposed to adjust the daylighting in the uh, in the uh, space. So this is almost like an attractor field, like right here, right? Um, but it's dependent upon the sun. The problem with it is, is that it, most of them don't work anymore. I don't know if any of them work anymore. So, you know, you know, caveat emptor, but, um, what's that? So they're stuck open or stuck closed? They're either stuck open or stuck closed. I think there's like one in this facade, like there's a couple you can see. There's like that one's stuck, that one's halfway stuck. Okay. They're stuck open. <laughs> but I'm going to show you anyway, all right? So. But uh, this is actually the scale of them inside the space. So, so in this, in the lobby, there are like two of these that equals a, equals a floor height. But they do uh, diffuse light. They have a vaguely sort of um, you know, like Islamic kind of uh, pattern, you know, like to them. Um, so they're really uh, they're really quite interesting in the way that they the way that, they're like uh, they're like the apertures on a camera. They kind of iris like open and closed uh, mechanically. Cut your finger off in there, All right? Or cut a cigar or something. I don't know. All right, so that's what they are. It is an interesting mechanical thing. So we can we can do those parametrically, and this is a Salk Institute. And the Salk Institute, this is not as like high tech, but these are these operable. Uh, there are these teak panels uh, and uh, uh, like sun shades and windows, and they can be open and closed depending upon what the occupants uh, uh, want to experience. So there's different photographs. If you go, this actually is a great photo because it actually shows. There's one that has these are all closed. This one is uh, this one's part way, and then this one this person opened a window. And so this is probably what Dale, he's nodding. He would like us to do something more like this than, you know, lasers and... And like human contact. Human contact, exactly. Yeah, that thing's behind it. It's actually in the glass. Like, you can't even get at the, the mechanism. Probably for safety reasons. But anyway, we can talk about, we can talk about vaguely uh, how we might consider designing something like that. And that has a lot to do with, with like I said, the, um, the tractor script. Right away, I'm not going to show you this right now, but what you can do uh, is that you could find the intersection of the sun on your uh, facade, right? You, you draw a point between that, that goes from the sun and passes through your facade, and then you could actually uh, use that as an attractor to, to change the scale of certain openings. Okay? Another thing you could do is you could just measure the angle at each point, and if it falls within a certain angle, you could open or close the aperture based on that. That's actually what I'm going to show you right now. And this will work for any kind of opening that you could you could think of, uh, really. So we do our old surface pattern that we do all the time. So we're going to reference the surface, and we're going to divide it. I guess we get some we get some panels. Let's just leave it at that for now. And then we're going to get uh, the centroids of all these and put some happy circles on there. We'll channel Bob Ross today. What what plane are the circles in? What should they be in if they're facing us? ZX. Thank you. Or XZ. I always get it backwards myself, but. Yes, because otherwise <clears throat> they don't. Oops, I messed that up. We'll do this, and then this, and then 
disconnect. All right, so we've got our circles on the surface, right? So those are, let's just say those are our apertures for now. And what we want to do is we want to change the radius of those with, with respect to the uh, sun angle. And what we want to do actually is instead of just taking the angle between the sun and some arbitrary point, I want to, in this case, I want to take the angle between, and actually I want to do something a little bit different. Hang on one second. I need a more interesting surface to make this really interesting. Okay, so I'm gonna do, I'm gonna reference this actually instead of the other surface. There we go, that's, that's a little bit better. I mean, I got some stuff going on here. Okay, then what I'm gonna do is, I'm, gonna, I'm actually gonna find the uh, angle between the centroids, which is where these, these apertures are and where the sun is, because then that's gonna be slightly different in every case. Um, and so what I'm gonna do is, um, I'm gonna go make a vector between the sun and all these points. And I'm gonna find the angle between that, ve that vector and in this case, I'm just gonna use an arbitrary axis. I'm just gonna say the X axis. I might need to adjust this later. Okay, and then what we're gonna do is, is that we need, we need to remap this. So we take a domain This might, this might not work the way I want it to, but we'll try it. Take the domain of the angles that come out. We should take the bounds of it, sorry. So we'll find the angle, the bounds, plug it in for the source domain, and then we'll take the list of angles as the target and then what we want to do is we want to map that. And so we get a range of numbers from zero to one that represent the various, like whether something is, is on angle with the sun or whether it's not angled with the sun. And then we're going to map that. I mean, we've mapped it and then we're going to multiply it to get the final radius. That way we can control it. And that's the radius of the circle. So we take that circle that we made all the way back here and we're finally going to tell it what the radius is. Okay, let's preview all this stuff off. I made it too small. Here we go. So there you go. So, oh, and I made the, I the reflex angle again. Just always, always do the opposite. Oops. Okay. Um, reflex. Okay. One second. So we're going to take the reflex angle. And we're going to take the reflex angle. Here. So yeah, this is really basic, but so where, where the sun is striking it most directly, the apertures are decreased in size, and where it's, where it's not currently, they're increased in size. So it's just a very, very simple relationship between the two. As the sun moves, see that? So changing, and we need to. We might need to do something actually with this to um, to actually get the, the the vector from each of these. But that's generally the idea. You want to take the measurement of, of each of those apertures and find its angle versus where the sun is. Again, I'll I'll put the script up. <clears throat> Something's a little backwards here, but we'll fix it. Okay, so. That's the kind of logic that you get, and you could the same idea about measuring the angle could be used if you, if you had a parametric window, let's just say at a surface that you could, you could change the distance, the distance between two lines. When the two lines are furthest apart, the window's fully closed, and when they're close together, the window's fully open. You could map that to a percentage of that opening and closing and do the same thing. So instead of just making it a radius, you're making it a, a percentage of a window opening and closing, okay? So you, could, you, could, you could do a facade that way as well. Remember, it's all just about, it's just about numbers. It's just about finding out one quantity and how it relates to the form that you want to create. So again, whether, whether, again, whether it's a radius or a percentage or an angle of rotation, um, that's the idea. <clears throat> okay. Light shelves. So light shelves are both a shading device or a, a glare reduction device and they're also um, a light distribution device. Here's an example here. I think you guys, you guys have studied these before. 
Um, and they can be internal to the building, they can be external, they can start on the, on the outside and go all the way to the inside. There's lots of different variations of this, right? And I'm not gonna give an example of this, but I think we kind of at this point know how to distribute geometry and know how to change the depth of it. What you can do is you can basically create this parametrically and put it in the sun, uh, put it in the V-ray sun system, and like Dale was suggesting, again, experiment for different times of the year to see the light penetration as you adjust the parameters. So you'd run a series of tests for you know, different, different days of the year, different times of day. You probably need about nine renderings, you know, morning, noon, and, and afternoon, from the 1st to the 15th to the 31st, let's say. And, and then that would give you kind of a baseline, and then you could begin to adjust these. And you know, again, you want to think about the kind of rules of thumb for these as you design it, so you're not constantly iteratively adjusting it. Um, and I'll have an example of this posted online as well. But so uh, a light shelf, and a light shelf, you know, you could actually have louvers uh, as well, and you could be adjusting those dynamically um, as part of your light shelf. Dale, you want to? Do you have a slide behind this? Next slide. I don't have one after. I have the one that has all the egg crate there. Egg crate. The egg crate. Yeah. Northeast, northwest. Okay. <laughs> okay. I've been watching you here all day. You got, you, you got like a 18% chance of being right. Well, what is it, is it, are you trying to block the sun? Or like that? I mean, the intention is to try to block the solar radiation. Block solar radiation. Obviously, that's what that's trying to shape. Right? Yeah. So, it's no, going I mean, no, I mean, to have yeah. some easterly or westerly orientation. Yeah. Uh, if it were southeast or southwest, then the entire geometric shape of this would probably want to rotate uh, from x, y axes mm. to have something like a, uh, say, 20 degree angle. You're talking about the, 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 yeah, the vertical the pieces? Vertical, yeah. Right. Those vertical, <laughs> those horizontals would mm. rotate, and then they would probably shift down and it would depend exactly on how easterly or westerly the building's oriented. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, a good example of that tent is on the New Mashinot building. Mm -hmm. uh, I actually had that. Yeah. Uh, and it also has to do specifically with how the <coughs> structure of that building works. Mm -hmm. It would seem to me that, that and especially in a place like Charlotte, which is off the garden of that doing a parametric assessment of those window apertures, those apertures for light, and spacing of those verticals for horizontal, and their angular relationship to one another mm -hmm. would be really an ideal kind of tool to Yeah. You know, guys, we don't know the location of this, but the more I look at it, the more I think it's southeast. Because of where the shadows are cast by yeah, the way. horizontal and vertical movers along that right, 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 right. <coughs> time of day, the mm. shadow, the altitude of the sun is pretty high. Mm. Right? I mean, you can kind of look for a clue at certain points. Now, I don't know. It depends on where the latitude is. If it's, if it's 46, 48, or if it's 24, then it's going to change that. But if it's typical U.S., I think it's in the U.S. Um, yeah. yeah. All right. So um, if you if you guys want to experiment with this, I, I have like, again I have a script that has this that you can experiment with, and there's a video actually posted from last year where we did a V-ray process with this to study this effect. So if you need it, let me know. Um, I'll, I'll send you the link to it. Um, last thing I want to talk about are light cannons or skylights, 
And again, this is a thing, I might not know the, the nomenclature that well, but to me, a light cannon is something that wants to create a particular sort of uh, you know, like dramatic effect. It's going, to, it's going to bring light into a certain uh, place. It's going, to, it's going to bounce light. A skylight is maybe just, a, just an opening that, that's going to bring light in to kind of, to kind of overly light a, a, a space. Okay? I'm going to show you examples of both. Um, you guys know this building, right? Third years, you have to because you drew it for a week. La Charette Monastery. It's very famous. I mean, I mean, basically, like Le Corbusier, light cannons were, were, were you know, like part of his, um, they were some of his tools. So you, there's a lot of different examples of them inside of, inside of the uh, crypt, inside of the, um, side of, you know, inside of like, the cloister area. But, you know, again, this is, this space right here, look at how dark, you know, this area is even darker on our projector, but then how much light gets brought into that area that draws your attention to that area. That's a particular instance. These are angled in a particular way to like scoop light in and bring it down. And we're not getting into this, but they're colored so that the light has a particular color. We saw this in the rendering uh, uh, lecture, how the color of something that the light hits, it actually, actually changes the color of the light that it scatters. And this is a fine example of that. You get into the ones that are inside of the cloister, and again, you know, bouncing them, and really drawing your eye to that space, those hot spots that it creates, and then, and then basically scattering that light that's colored. That's something that we can uh, design parametrically because we want to capture you know, direct sun in a particular time of day. If you were designing a religious structure, perhaps it would be for a particular time of like a service or something like that, right? That would be something you could design for, or when it's occupied. This is a, a, a recent Corbusier. St. Pierre was completed in 2006 um, by one of Corbusier's um, I don't know, workers or students, I guess. I don't know the whole story, but, but this is another example of it. And this is based on plans that he had left and uh, this also uses light guns in a very particular, light, light cannons in a very particular way. You can see this, look at, I mean, that's, that's, like, that's like basically a diagram right there. Um, and you can see it coming into the, uh, to the space. So it's a very, very beautiful uh, building. These are some kind of, you know, like banal ones. They look like garbage cans kind of buried in this thing. But um, inside the space, though, they're really kind of pleasant. You know, again, with the, with the, with, with the painted thing. This is a community center. They really bring in light to that lower level where there's children playing, apparently. The Salvador Dali Museum, I encourage you to Google this. It's absolutely crazy. Um, but they, they actually bring in, uh, on particular, particular paintings, they bring in light down uh, from the roof at a particular angle. Um, St. Bride's Church, another famous example of bringing in um, light, another like religious space, All right, light, light guns. Um, Kunsthal. Uh, or uh, uh, Kunstas Gras, really crazy. These are actually more like skylights than light guns. I don't know if you guys know this project, but um, you know, again, these are angled north to bring in indirect light and um, bring that into the space. You can. This is actually what it looks like in the space. And then at night, they're illuminated by tubes in those. If you see, this is an installation that somebody did, but that's the that's what the form of them looks like in sort of a diagrammatic way. They start as a hexagon and they kind of compress loft to a to a circle. You could do that. I don't like there. It's like it seems like it's not maybe not bringing in that much light. I don't know. <laughs> they just look weird. All of you guys in third year who went to the Clemson Week Three project saw the reuse of the witch hats. The the piano used on the uh, uh, Meyer uh, the high, high museum edition. Uh, if you've got photographs of the interior of that, digital photographs, they're all facing north. Mm -hmm. They they should have a blue hue to them because hmm. they're drawing from that the, the skylight. Sky yeah. Uh, as opposed to mixing that light in the can itself. Uh, so there's a real distinct issue of can you use that blue hue to your advantage mm -hmm. in the creation of space versus something that would be only in the and you'll, you'll notice this. I mean, I mean, Dale, you should listen to Dale before anything else, but when you do V-Ray, the temperature of the light changes as you go through the day. If you notice, some of your renderings 
are really yellow, and then some of them are very blue, and that's actually because of that, because of that skybox effect. Can you change that? You can manually change it, but it, it's it's built in uh, to do that to tr to try to to try to simulate that. Yeah, it gets more red as the sun sets. Yeah, but you can actually desaturate that as you, as you like. Um, so I wanted to show you last um, a light gun script. And I pray that I actually have the file for this. Okay. Okay. Yes. Tubes. Aha. All right. So we have the sun system. Let's take a step back through this and talk about how this works. So I have a surface that I reference. And, you know, oh, please don't crash on me. Damn you. <laughs> Stand by. It's just so cool that it breaks my computer. All right. One second. Got to get that looked at. All right. <clears throat> Once more. At least this time we have the final. Okay, so I have a surface. And, you know, um, you can do it with pretty much anything. But I chose um, a dramatic one just to kind of exaggerate the effect. Okay, bring me light guns. There we go. Okay, back to it. So, start off the script with our old friend subdivide surface. And then what we do is we find the centroids of those and we use that to, and what I've, what I've actually done is actually moved them up slightly because I wanna, I wanna get the angle of where the sun is gonna come into my light gun. Okay, so I move those points up from the surface at the height that I want. And you can do that according to uh, like another script. I just move them all the same. And then basically I created a line that goes from the sun to those points. So that's a diagram of where the sun's gonna hit, essentially. Dale, yeah, I'm... <laughs> Oh, so I need to just get them all the same, the same angle. Fair enough. Okay, that's why I have you guys here. Okay. It looks cool to me. Yeah, yeah. We could. Okay, so what what we could do is we could we could basically use the same vector for each one instead of instead of each one having its own its own vector. That, that's exactly that's exactly why you're here. They're going to have. Yeah. If you look at um, these, yeah. Fair, yes. Fair enough. All right. Then um, what I did was I'm using those lines as vectors to distribute uh, the openings, the rectangles. Okay. And I can control those openings right now parametrically. Okay. And then I'm going to actually have a little, I have a little like rotation in here because there's actually a thing uh, that the orientation, well, well, we'll see that in a second. But I need, I need this to fix a bug. Okay, then we explode uh, the BRAP to get access to these curves, which are going to form the basis of a new loft. So we're going to loft from here to here, basically, along a vector. And that's actually how you create this uh, tube. And, and then, see, I have to, have to flip these. OK. Now what happens is uh, i got to get my son back. OK. Depending upon the time of day that you want. <laughs> Whoa. Yeah. They're like watching a tennis match or something, right? Um, but depending upon when, you know, where you orient it, depending upon the, the base surface, depending upon the aperture opening, like you can essentially, with the technique, you can begin to design light guns, okay? If you get the rays parallel. Uh, so anyway, I'll post the script as well. You could play with different cross sections. You could have like circles or hexagons or like what have you, uh, strips and slits. 
you know, and the whole thing is is fully parameterized. So you could actually call some of this too, so that they're not. It's not a complete. I mean, that's kind of like if you think about how you might make something like this. You, know, you kind of subdivide it, choose a few of these things to begin to make into light guns, and then follow a, follow a script um, that's kind of similar to this. Mm -hmm. Some kind of saint feast or something. Yeah. yeah. All Souls Day. There we go. Mm -hmm. There you go. So anyway, um, and then you could, you could bake this geometry. And um, one thing you have to do, you could, you could fabricate this. You need to actually, it's a surface right now, you need to actually offset these to create solids and then blend them together, but you could, you could fab these then, put them in your model, okay? There's lots of different uh, shapes that would work with this. So anyway, I just wanted to give you guys a sort of overview, but um, when you do this, and, and this, again, this is why I had Dale and John here, um, you want to keep yourself honest with these things. You want to actually look in, the, in your, go back to your day learning books um, and make sure that you have the theory right because it's really easy to convince yourself that this stuff actually is doing what you say it is. You can always verify it experimentally by, by rendering it, but you'll save yourself a lot of trouble if you do it right in the first place. So bother these guys uh, to make sure that you're getting your metrics right. Do you guys have any final uh, thoughts? Uh, Daniel, you were... You got a live man. Yeah. JP here. JP. Yeah. You guys share what you did After it's right. yeah, after class, yeah. Might be interesting to see the question of where that could go relative to Oh sure. Oh yeah. The stuff doesn't stop at Grasshopper, right? We've always said that from from the first day. Um, but again, you know, this is a way to kind of begin. To, to visualize these things, maybe prototype them. You can put them in other tools and study them.